Have you ever wondered about the untold stories that shape our world? Prepare to dive into a shocking narrative that connects Wall Street's power and a country's fate. Join us as we unearth the hidden truths behind Haiti's long occupation by U.S. forces and the pivotal role played by financial giants in shaping history. In the annals of history, certain stories remain buried beneath the surface, obscured by the passage of time. Today, we journey back to 1914, a fateful year that set the stage for one of the most enduring and controversial chapters in American history, the occupation of Haiti. But what if I told you that this occupation had roots not only in military strategy, but also in the corridors of financial power? Picture this, a group of American Marines walks into Haiti's National Bank, hauling away half a million dollars in gold worth $14 million today. What follows is a sequence of events that intertwines Wall Street's ambitions with a nation's destiny. As we delve into the drowsy hours of that December afternoon, the hidden connections between finance, force, and a fragile nation's fate come to light. Stay with us as we piece together the puzzle, revealing a narrative of intrigue, manipulation, and the complex forces that shape Haiti's history. Get ready to uncover the shocking truths of a forgotten past that resonates even today. Behind the curtains of public explanations lies a different narrative, one that weaves the influence of Wall Street into the very fabric of Haiti's history. Decades of diplomatic correspondence, financial reports, and archival records meticulously reviewed by the New York Times, unveil a complex web of motivations that pushed the United States to seize control of Haiti, all orchestrated by the likes of Wall Street, particularly the bank that would later evolve into Citigroup. Pressure from the predecessor of Citigroup, National Citibank, played a pivotal role in shaping Haiti's fate. In the shadows of these financial maneuvers, the United States displaced French influence and emerged as the dominant power in Haiti for decades. The narrative unfolds with a startling episode. A group of American Marines marching into Haiti's National Bank, making off with half a million dollars in gold. The act, a precursor to the full-scale invasion, marked the beginning of an occupation characterized by brutality and control. By the time U.S. forces set foot in Haiti in 1915, the nation had already endured decades of surrendering significant portions of its meager earnings to France. Although Haiti had valiantly overthrown its French oppressors, the ghost of colonial demands returned as French warships demanded exorbitant sums, undermining the country's ability to grow since its inception. Enter French bankers, who enticed a debt-ridden nation with loans. However, these loans came at a cost. Commissions, interest, and fees siphoned away Haitian resources, leaving profits for French shareholders surpassing even the government's public works budget. Subsequently, American intervention painted a picture of safeguarding Haitian sovereignty, yet Wall Street's motivations were far from altruistic. U.S. financial institutions saw profitability in the turmoil. Annual reports and historical records reveal a startling truth. A quarter of Haiti's revenue was redirected to pay debts controlled by National City Bank and its affiliates, outstripping funds allocated for public education. The American financial officers in charge prioritized their own salaries over the nation's well-being exacerbating the cycle of despair. The occupation, portrayed by some as an imposition of order, harbored darker truths of suppression, violence, and forced labor. The occupation's legacy remains a topic of debate, with tangible gains like hospitals and infrastructure contrasted by forced labor and human rights abuses. Meanwhile, Haiti's legacy of poverty persists partly due to the foreign meddling that hindered its development. Over a century later, the United States continues to exert influence in Haitian politics, propping up leaders amid controversies. 
the legacy of foreign interference remains deeply intertwined with Haiti's trajectory. The recent assassination of the president echoes the ongoing struggles for autonomy and self-determination, detrimental to American interests. Amid the convoluted tapestry of history, one phrase echoed louder than the rest, detrimental to American interests. This sentiment, seeped in fear and ambition, rippled through the corridors of power for decades, casting a shadow on Haiti's path to independence. In 1826, Robert Y. Hayne of South Carolina, a staunch defender of slavery, delivered an impassioned plea to his fellow lawmakers. His words resonated with the Southern planters who saw Haiti's emergence from a slave uprising as a harbinger of change. To Hayne, acknowledging Haiti's independence or even broaching the topic of slavery was akin to courting disaster, a potential unraveling of their cherished way of life. The specter of Denmark, Vesey's failed slave insurrection, loomed large in Hayne's memory. Born on a rice plantation, Hayne had intimate ties to the institution of slavery, having once owned and enslaved 140 individuals. His fear was not just of Haiti, but of the very discussion that Haiti's liberation might spark. This topic, he believed, could jeopardize what he and many others considered their dearest interests. Years passed, and even as the nation marched toward the brink of civil war, the recognition of Haiti remained a distant prospect. Only a southern state seceded from the Union did President Abraham Lincoln seize the opportunity to recognize Haiti, albeit partially driven by the aim of finding a new home for freed slaves. Haiti, along with Liberia, was identified as a possible refuge for these freedmen and a modest settlement was established. The early 20th century ushered in a complex interplay of strategic interests, converging at the crossroads of the Caribbean. Haiti occupied a pivotal position, adjacent to the Panama Canal's construction and in proximity to Puerto Rico and Cuba, both impacted by American influence. The Dominican Republic, sharing an island with Haiti, found itself subject to American control over import and export taxes. As the 20th century unfurled its complexities, Haiti's National Bank became a focal point of opportunity. In 1910, the United States sensed a chance to secure a foothold in Haiti's affairs, challenging the sway of the French. The stage was set for a tussle of interests, with American ambitions looming large through these intricacies, the refrain of detrimental to American interests echoed not only as a harbinger of caution, but also as a testament to the intricate dance of power, politics, and economic ambitions. Haiti's journey, marked by struggles for autonomy, was shaped by the intertwined destinies of nations vying for supremacy on the global stage. The unraveling web of foreign control, the so-called National Bank, was an intricate puppeteer, orchestrating financial maneuvers that spanned continents. Its name might have suggested Haitian ownership, but the reality was starkly different. Established in 1880 by the French bank Crédit Industriel et Commercial, it was an entity designed not to serve the interests of Haiti but to yield staggering profits for its foreign investors and shareholders, predominantly based in France. Control rested in the hands of his Parisian board, rendering the national tag misleading at best. Haiti's treasury found itself in chains as the government was forced to navigate a labyrinth of commissions and fees simply to deposit or access its own funds. The sense of exploitation grew so deep that the Haitian authorities accused the very institution of fraud, a charge that led to the imprisonment of some of its employees. As Haitian mistrust swelled, French and German investors seized the opportunity to restructure the bank's ownership under new European guardianship. Yet the United States, 
ever vigilant of its interests, saw this move as a threat not just to itself, but to the very autonomy and welfare of the Haitian people. The State Department's response was unequivocal. This could not be allowed. Secretary of State Philander Knox, invoking the interests of both nations and the sovereignty of Haiti, summoned Wall Street's key players to Washington. Under his encouragement, four American banks, including the National City Bank of New York, secured substantial shares in the reconfigured bank. A German bank took another slice, while the largest portion remained ensconced in Paris. Haitian voices in the decision-making remained conspicuously absent. Jean Corradin, a Haitian historian and former ambassador to the United Nations, captured the gravity of the situation succinctly. It was the first time in the history of our relations with the United States that they intervened so openly in our affairs. With the new National Bank's establishment, the cycle of exploitation resumed. Deposits and expenses became revenue streams, with profits flowing to foreign shareholders. A loan was extended to the Haitian government, with deductions leaving Haiti with a mere fraction of the amount borrowed. The staggering imbalance led Haitians to question the motives behind the deal. Suspicions swirled about which politicians might have been influenced or paid off to seal such a detrimental arrangement. The bank's power grew to such proportions that it sparked a public existential crisis. Had Haiti effectively relinquished its hard-fought independence? In the intricate web of financial manipulation, French shareholders voiced concerns over growing American dominance. Their fears were well-founded the U.S. investment in the purportedly national bank marked the inception of a broader American agenda, one aimed at prying France's grip from Haiti. And at the center of this campaign stood a singular figure, urging the forces of control onward. In 1911, Farnham was lured away from his journalistic roots by the siren call of National City Bank. The bank, driven by its ambitions abroad, recognized in him a potent weapon to further its interests. One of his earliest assignments was Haiti, a nation ensnared in the complex web of financial power plays. Farnham's journey through Haiti was marked by an unusual mode of transportation. Saddle horses imported from Wyoming carried him across the country, but beneath this unassuming facade, lay a man who was rapidly becoming the American government's most invaluable informant on Haiti. Washington had already witnessed Farnham's prowess in maneuvering political landscapes. He had orchestrated intricate schemes to sway Congress's choice of Panama for the canal, a feat that earned him recognition and influence. His presence at the State Department became a frequent occurrence and his close association with William Jennings Bryan, the Secretary of State during President Woodrow Wilson's tenure, solely defeat his standing. As the pages of history turned, Bryan found himself facing the enigma of Haiti, a nation shrouded in mystery and unfamiliarity. Reconnaissing his own limited knowledge about this Caribbean country, he turned to John H. Allen, a pivotal figure who had transitioned from managing Haiti's National Bank to ascending the ranks within National City Bank. It was 1912, and Brian's request to Allen held a simple directive, tell me everything there is about Haiti. The resulting account of their encounter depicted Brian's candid astonishment. As Allen recounted, Brian's words encapsulated his surprise. Dear me, consider it black speaking French. The irony was not lost on those who knew Brian's history. He had been a vocal opponent of Wall Street's influence, famously declaring, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Yet in a twist of fate, he leaned on Farnham's advice in spite of his prior convictions. Their interactions spanned Washington's halls telegrams traversed between them, and private letters bridged the gap. 
Brian and Farnham's alliance deepened to a point where Brian sought Farnham's counsel before expanding his team of government employees. This seemingly unlikely partnership, forged in the crucible of competing interests, would leave a profound mark on the unfolding drama of Haiti's fate. Recognizing the potent leverage his connections granted, Farnham embarked on a fateful journey, leveraging his influence to advocate for an invasion of Haiti under the banner of safeguarding American corporate interests. His approach was cunning, sparking Washington's interest by conjuring the specter of a German takeover, a tactic that sent ripples of concern through the corridors of power. National Citibank's growing presence in Haiti set the stage for Wall Street's foray into the nation's affairs. As Farnham's orchestrated narrative unfolded, Wall Street's shadow began to extend over Haiti's leaders, effectively asserting its influence by strategically withholding funds held by the National Bank. The contours of this maneuver were etched by Farnham's hand, yet its impact reverberated far beyond him. As the plot thickened, the State Department came to embrace what diplomats dubbed the Farnham Plan. This plan became a blueprint for the insidious orchestration of events that would culminate in the American takeover of Haiti's imports and export tariffs. These tariffs, more than mere financial mechanisms, were a lifeblood for Haiti, a nation striving for economic sustenance. The decision to wrest control of these tariffs from the hands of the Haitian authorities marked a critical turning point, illustrating how manipulation disguised as assistance, could yield far-reaching consequences. The puppeteer tightens his grip. The evolving tale of influence took a more audacious turn as Roger Leslie Farnham's maneuvers shifted into high gear. Despite being minority stakeholders in the National Bank, Farnham orchestrated a shift in the balance of power. He artfully spun a narrative, highlighting France's preoccupation with World War I as a pretext for active management from New York. As Farnham's plan gained traction, the State Department drafted a convention mirroring his vision, tapping him to be its messenger. Farnham's journey was not without its tensions. Haitian lawmakers railed against their foreign minister, accusing him of orchestrating a sellout to the United States. A fiery confrontation erupted within the National Assembly as they voiced their rage through both words and actions. The National Bank, now an instrument of manipulation in the hands of those with ulterior motives, wielded its power to punish Haiti's defiance. It withheld funds, plunging an already fragile government into deeper turmoil. The ensuing instability was palpable, reflected in the revolving door of presidents, five leaders in three years, each ousted in coups funded by German merchants operating within Port-au-Prince. Amid this maelstrom, the State Department escalated its involvement. December 1914 marked a turning point as Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan authorized a marine operation of unprecedented scale. The operation saw the audacious seizure of $500,000 in gold. Curiously, the trigger for this audacious move was a last-minute consultation with none other than Farnham, the puppet master pulling strings from behind the scenes. A calculated heist balancing ambitions. As the wheels of influence spun faster, Haiti's sovereignty stood at the precipice of brazen infringement. The marine operation that netted $500,000 in gold triggered a storm of outrage within the Haitian government. The central bank funds, snatched in what they decried as a flagrant invasion, underscored the profound indignation of an independent nation. Yet, in a brazen display of audacity, the United States brushed aside the vehement complaints. Justification was offered in the language of protectionism. American interests, they asserted, were in grave peril, and drastic action was imperative. In the intricate web of influence, American politicians and financiers moved with a cadence that was at times harmonious and at others 
discordant. The symbiotic relationship between Wall Street and Washington was characterized by layers of collusion that occasionally diverged. Historians like Peter James Hudson, a UCLA associate professor, underscore the complexity of this alliance, noting that while collusion was undeniable, its contours often bore the mark of contradiction. Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan found himself treading a nuanced path, oscillating between different perspectives on America's role in Haiti. His convictions suggested that Haiti needed the guardianship of the United States, yet he harbored reservations about being a mere instrument for Wall Street's machinations. In a letter to President Wilson, he articulated his hesitations, expressing discomfort with forcible intervention solely for business gains. However, Roger Leslie Farnham, driven by his own agenda, exerted relentless pressure on Bryan. Farnham's tactics included a veiled threat, a declaration that all American businesses would abandon Haiti unless the United States government stepped in to secure their interests. This ultimatum pushed Bryan to reconsider his stance, ultimately lending support to the prospect of invasion. In Bryan's words to President Wilson, a calculated transaction emerged from this negotiation. American interests would remain, assuming the role of the nation's financial bedrock. This move, however, came with a condition. The United States government had to undertake the necessary measures to ensure their protection. Bryan's shift echoed the hidden tango between the corridors of power, intertwining political maneuvering with economic ambitions. The saga of Haiti's struggle against manipulation, as orchestrated by figures like Roger Leslie Farnham, serves as a powerful reminder of the hidden currents that drive decisions and reshape the course of events.